Hi, everybody. First of all, thanks to the Write the Docs team for inviting me to speak and for having found the energy to keep running these conferences. And thank you for listening. In case you don't already know me, I'm Daniela. I'm Chief Collaboration Officer at Divio, but only for a few weeks more because I'm going to be taking a break in June, then looking for something new to do. I've been with Divio for seven years now, which is quite a long time in this industry. And in my next role, I'd like to find myself with a company that has a significant product, a large developer user base, a positive internal culture, and also has some very big developer education or documentation challenges that need to be addressed at the highest level. So please get in touch if that's you, because I'd love to talk. And it's quite possible that you know me already for this. It's the Diataxis documentation authoring framework. It's a guide to what needs to be in documentation and how it should be written and so on. People seem to quite like it and find it useful. Unfortunately, it often gets mistaken for a plan or for the structure of a plan that someone should make. And that's what people do. They build up complicated, detailed plans for their work based on this structure. I don't blame them because sometimes I mistake it for a plan myself. It's not to do with this particular structure, of course. What I've just described represents a problem of planning and executing work in documentation in general. And this problem is what this talk is about. Now, when I was a child, my grandparents had a bookcase that I admired very much. I thought it was very elegant with glass doors that lifted up into each shelf. And I inherited it when they died and I learned more about it. It was a design patent, patented in the 1890s. It's a modular stacking design. And what you see here is composed of six different modules and modules can also connect to each other um, horizontally. It's made by the Globe Vernick company and it's a really lovely piece of furniture. And at the back of each, each section, there's the maker's label with the slogan, always complete, but never finished which sounded like a very good thing to me 30 years ago. And here it is again, applied to documentation. I want to discuss what it might mean for documentation to be always complete, but never finished. First, let me confess, my work in documentation causes me a certain amount of pain, not bad, pain, just the normal pain of doing work that's sometimes difficult, like the pain of riding a bicycle up a mountain. It can even be good pain sometimes, but still it's a kind of suffering. And sincerely, I hope that you all suffer from it too sometimes, because I don't want to be one who suffers alone. And from this suffering, there is a reward to be had, like the one of getting to the top of the mountain th that requires you to go through the pain. On the other hand, we also in life and work sometimes go through unnecessary, useless pain, which is not good pain, never is. And nobody wants that in their work. So this talk is about minimizing unnecessary, useless pain so that you can enjoy the rewards of your work more. I often find in documentation that the easy part is doing it and the hard part is knowing what to do. In the case of riding the bike up the mountain, the hard part is doing it. You have to keep on pedaling and going up and that's it. The road only goes in one direction. Eventually you find yourself at the top. When I'm working on documentation, on the other hand, doing the work is usually not that hard. I find I can turn my knowledge and understanding into readable, useful written words without suffering a great deal. What I find painful is trying to work out what to do working out the plan, what topics to tackle, in what order, where to start, how to divide up the work and the writing, how much to do, where and when to stop, and so on. And then if I realise that the plan didn't work and I have to go back to the beginning again to come up with a new one, that's painful. And if you find that painful, then I think that the work of documentation can often be a very effective source of pain. Typically, I experience it when I'm sitting staring at a blank page or brand new empty documentation set, wondering how and where to get started. 
or when I'm faced with a complicated restructuring effort. I think a lot of the pain comes from the feeling that whatever I am planning is not going to be completable in one go or in some reasonable period of time. And that until it is, it won't have any use or value to anyone. And from talking to other people, I don't think I'm alone in this feeling. It gets worse when the thing that you're trying to document is itself in flux, because now all the ground is moving and shaking under your feet while you're trying to erect your edifice upon it. And you're trying to update your plans at the same time just to keep up. And to be in the middle of a lengthy and difficult restructuring exercise and discovering that someone else in the meantime has committed to a dozen of the files that you were working on, that's as if they've inadvertently knocked your work right out of your hands while you were doing it. And that's the kind of documentation pain that I don't want to experience. It's not the necessary success-producing pain of pedaling to get to the top of your mountain. It's the useless frustration and anguish of having your bicycle stolen from outside a cafe. And I think that what's fundamentally responsible for this pain is planning. We make plans, we execute them, and then we arrive at our result. This is a fairly normal way of doing things. Projects demand plans. At the same time, complex projects have a knack of luring us into creating complicated plans that we draw all the way to our envisaged finish lines. The next thing we know, we are staring at a mountain of complicated work of our own making, a huge, messy, unstable, treacherous mountain. And until we have finished executing our plans, we won't have anything useful to show for our efforts. There's just the unsightly spectacle of work in progress. Until the work in progress has attained a certain degree of completion such that it can be shared or published, it's useless. So it's bad enough that there's a lot of hard work to do. What makes it even worse is the feeling of anxiety that you won't see the results for a long time, or possibly ever, if you're not able to bring the whole plan to fruition. Here is a graph to make it look scientific. We don't even start to achieve a degree of usefulness until very late, after quite a lot of work. Each time there is some complex documentation work to be done, we have to go through a long period of difficult labour without being able to publish or share the fruits of all that labour. It's labour without reward, which is the worst kind. And this is the way with most complex projects, and most of them have to be like this. If you're building or, or rebuilding a ship, it's not a useful ship until it's finished enough to be floated or, or refloated in the water. In fact, it's worse than useless because it's taking up space in the shipyard and consuming money and time and effort. And maybe that's okay for ships, maybe that's just the way it has to be. But in the case of documentation, it's different. Documentation is about a product, it, about something that needs documentation now. And the period of execution with nothing to show for the results is a period of risk in which the product is crying out for the documentation it needs and doesn't have. It's a period in which the product itself or something else can change and upset our documentation plans. The more complex the documentation project, the more complex the plans have to be, and the longer that period of uselessness and the more at risk our plans will be as a result. And it's happened to me more than once that while I was toiling away on some complicated documentation work, it took me so long that the target moved and my work was out of date even before I managed to complete it. It was work sitting in the shipyard, taking up space, consuming energy and time, and which in the end never even got to see the water. And that's a trap, not exclusive to documentation, but I think that documentation can be especially vulnerable to it. Personally, I've fall, fallen into this trap fairly often, and I've seen colleagues and clients do it too. And I realised rather late, I think, that I've even been responsible for pushing other people into that trap, inadvertently, of course. I've done workshops, and I've been asked to look over documentation proposals, in which people have eagerly taken this shape and filled it in in tremendous detail. They've created deeply nested lists of content, 
that needs to be created and slotted into the right place or that will need to be filleted out and reinserted somewhere else. And then they look at what they've drawn up for themselves and they seem a bit taken aback at the scale and complexity of the task that they've just described. But this structure is not intended to be a plan or, or the basis of a plan. It's a guide. It's just a, a map to help you check that you're in the right place and going in the right directions. It's definitely not a prompt to drop a detailed plan for your work. And yet, whatever structure we're given, I think we have, in general, a propensity to try to make a plan out of it. As I said, I think it's a trap. I think the lure of planning is a very effective trap. And I think we need better ways to think about it to help us keep out of its clutches. It's sneaky because it makes, it makes us think that we're reaching for something that we ought to attain, whereas in fact what it, it's offering is something quite out of reach, and so we lose our balance and fall in. And I think I have a good way of explaining this now. I think that we fall into this trap because we confuse the finished with the complete. And the way out is to understand that as a living project, our documentation will never be finished and never needs to be finished. That can always be complete and always should be. I'm not going to go so far as to say that documentation is better without any planning, but I do believe that planning can comfortably afford to take a back seat and that documentation work can often be more successfully led by concrete, iterative, evolutionary processes. What works for me is an approach based on a principle of well-formed growth. Here's a plant. I'm not a botanist, but it looks well-structured to me. It looks complete. How did it arrive at this form? Did it have a plan? Did it have a clear idea of what it was going to become? I think it probably did not. I think that an organic process took place. It grew through an organic process in which development took place at the cellular level, guided by rules that applied to cells without the need to refer to a master plan or a finished picture of a mature form. In its development from a seed to its mature form, an organism such as a plant is always complete. It's always appropriate to its size and it's always ready to progress to the next step. So here's the little French bean. Here it is with a root. Here it is then with a root system. And eventually we have a mature organism. Along the way, you can never say that something's missing. It's always complete. In fact, it's always perfect. A beautiful, wonderful little example of the French bean. But is it finished? No, because there's always something for it to do next for it to become. There's always another step that it can take in its development. So its development, development is never finished, but the organism is always complete. And yes, its growth towards a fully developed shape of maturity, but this isn't a shape that's knowable from the outset. It's just a direction of growth with an outcome that is not fixed. It's a growth, it's growth that is positively expected to adapt to conditions that themselves could change at any time. So at any given moment, it's complete, but not finished because it's a living, growing, adapting mechanism. And in this growth, it's visibly and clearly well-formed at all times. Its structure, which changes as it grows, is always correct. And what's responsible for its well formed structure. It's not working to a blueprint or following a carefully drawn up plan. It doesn't have an idea what it's going to be or ought to be. It doesn't have a big picture and it doesn't need a big picture to maintain and develop its well formed structure. Instead, it has a cellular organization and order ordering. Its structure comes from within. It builds itself from the inside out one cell at a time. As an organism, it experiences healthy growth and good structure when each cell attains a healthy structure, when each cell develops according to the rules for that kind of cell. And I think there are some lessons from this for documentation. 
So I think that we can apply the ideas of well-formed growth that operates at a cellular level, and I think we can apply the distinction between the complete and the finished to help make some sense of problems we face in documentation. And when we do this, I think work on documentation stops being execution of a plan. Instead, it becomes something analogous to organic, healthy growth. It takes place from the inside, at the cellular level, and it's always in the direction of a mature and fully developed shape that doesn't need to know what that shape is or and doesn't need that shape to be fixed and stable. And if we trust this approach, then we can have confidence that it will always guide us towards good structure and that everything we do will be a step of progress. So I think we can profit from a workflow of iterative evolution. This is what I've learned to do. So if you don't already have something that you know you want to improve, don't go looking for something to do, for something to put right, for a problem. Just look at what you have right in front of you right now, the file you're in, the last page you read. It doesn't matter. If there isn't one, just choose something literally at random. Now, consider this thing critically. And preferably, it's a small thing. Nothing bigger than a page, better, a section or a paragraph or a sentence or even a single word. Challenge it according to your documentation standards. Ask it some difficult questions. If you're using the Ataxis, those questions might be what user need is represented by this? How well does it serve that need? What could be added, moved, or removed, or changed to serve that better? Um, do the language and logic here meet the requirements of this mode of documentation? And then, crucially, ask what single next action will produce an immediate improvement? And then complete that next single action and then go round and do it all over again. The important thing here is the scale of ambition. It's tiny. The, scale, the cycle is very small and very short. We're not tackling grand plans. We're not, we're not even thinking in terms of solving problems. We're just looking at something small enough to fit in our hand and then doing one thing to make it better. We've even stopped thinking in terms of priorities or worrying about what's most important. And I like this approach because it gives me license not to worry. It allows me to decide that a whole lot of things are simply not my problem anymore. The only thing I need to think about is whatever I happen to find in my hand. I'm immediately relieved from one of the great stresses of my work writing documentation, which is to be responsible for unfinished work that will not have value until it's finished according to its plan. It takes me from difficult thinking to easy doing. I've agreed with myself that the work will never be finished. I've agreed that every single action will be a step, however small, that represents growth and development. And I no longer have to take responsibility for anything more burdensome than the improvement of one single cell at a time. For me, this approach works equally well with new documentation and when restructuring or refactoring or reorganizing something that already exists. For brand new projects, it fosters the creation of material that has useful value ab initio. It produces ways to, in, it provides ways to ensure that even very modest portions of work produce right from the outset meaningful, useful, and publishable material. And that all additional effort positively adds value immediately. For restructuring efforts, it works from the inside out iteratively transforming content in place until it has assumed the shape that it should have, minimizing the need for dramatic refactoring, making it possible to postpone the transplanting of material until the material itself is robust enough to survive that process without harm. As you may know, refactoring documentation can often be much more difficult than refactoring code because badly refactored code, at least, will have the decency to fail automated tests whereas similar mistakes in documentation can break logical flow in ways that are much harder to detect. Anyway, in, in both these cases, the approach helps to keep the work flowing organically. And it makes whatever framework or architecture you adopt for your documentation much more clearly a guide to evaluating what you have in front of you and deciding on an immediate next action. And it helps its 
stop being a temptation to drop big plans. For example, if you're using the DataAxis framework, the system becomes more clearly concerned with asking questions about user need and how to serve them. Now, the technical challenges of producing high quality of content, of course, remain and always will remain. But this method does allow the writer to deal with those challenges without also bearing unnecessary burdens. And I, I feel the need to show you that it really does work in practice by providing concrete examples. So I've chosen two. One's an example of something I built from scratch where there previously was no documentation. And the other is a restructuring of a fairly large and established project. For the new project in February, I pricked up an old idea of mine that I'd set aside a couple of years ago. I had a few lines of object-oriented Python in which, just for fun, I tried to model some of the mechanisms of a 35 millimeter film camera that I'd, that I'd been repairing. And I turned this into a project that I would write some documentation for, as an example, specific, specifically for this talk. And I want to talk you through the development of this documentation, which I tried to produce as far as I could in exactly the same way as if I were doing it for real. So let's walk through that history. Let's walk through some of the commits that I made to the documentation. Here's the initial Python file that I had lying around. I tidied it up a bit and I added a readme file, of course. If I were tempted into planning, I'd write out my headings. A very bad move. They wouldn't remind me of anything that I wouldn't remember anyway. They would just cause me anguish by representing visibly lacking incomplete work. So instead I asked, what could I do right now that would be an appropriate single step along the path of development and growth for this documentation? And I wrote a few lines under the heading, get started, a proto tutorial, in fact. A little later, I added some reference material, a list of components of the camera model. And then a new section of explanation, explaining what the point of the project is. By now, I'd also developed the code a little bit, and when I added some reference material about exceptions in the code, it joined the components section and I put them both under a new heading reference. When I added tests, I added a how to run tests section. I expanded the explanation material and then that turned into a new main section of its own as well. And then at this point, it simply felt too big to be in a single readme file. It had reached the point where it burst out of its shell, just like a French bean, so the different sections became individual pages in a Sphinx-powered documentation set. I didn't have to, th well, I had to think about it, but I didn't have to plan for it. I, it had just reached the point where this felt like the most obvious and the easiest thing to do. So of course I published it on Read the Docs and I've continued to develop both the project and the documentation. And some while ago it attained a reasonably mature shape. All I need to do now is just keep it growing and developing. When I have other things that I'm supposed to be doing, I find it quite easy to get absorbed in work that distracts me from doing them. And the Python model itself has become more sophisticated and fine grained. I have to be quite honest, at some point along the way, the actual project of modeling a camera in Python got completely out of hand. I don't know how many hours I have spent painstakingly disassembling the camera, studying its mechanisms to understand how they work, doing research on the mathematics of light and so on. And that's even before working out how to re represent them in code, never mind write documentation. I posted it to Hacker News one Friday evening. By Monday, the GitHub repository had 120 stars. So apparently, people are pleased to see a 45-year-old camera modeled in Python. I was only supposed to be doing it to serve as an example in a two-minute segment of a conference talk. But coming back to the documentation, what I liked about this experience was the feeling that at no time was I publishing something lacking. It felt like growing a little bean seed into a plant. I had to nurture it, think about it and do things, but at no point did I have the feeling of an uncompleted plan hanging over my head. I published the documentation early and often and felt happy to have immature, unfinished, not yet fully developed documentation because it never felt that anything was missing from it. It needed to grow, but it was always in the right form for its stage of growth. And importantly, that documentation was always useful and always made sense. And every additional bit of work I did added to its usefulness and represented growth in the right direction. It felt like this. It felt like I'd made something or was making something that wasn't finished, but was still at every stage complete. 
The other project perhaps you're familiar with is PyTest. PyTest is a Python-based automated testing framework with a lot of documentation. There's a lot of good material in there, carefully written, well-written content, but it's in disorder with a lot of structural problems. It's pretty large, so this contents list goes on for many, many more pages, and it has grown up organically. But I don't think you could call it well-structured growth or well-formed growth. It has just grown unguided with an almost complete lack of structure. And I've actually tried to do some restructuring on PyTest before with the blessing of the PyTest development team um, in 2017 at the EuroPython sprints and in the weeks that followed. And I put a lot of work into it with multiple commits touching dozens of files and the attempt failed. The experience has been on my mind. And in fact, that experience helped me formulate the approach that I use now. The reason it failed is that I treated the attempt much as I would a large code refactoring that had to be finished before it could be called useful. I walked myself into a trap. And then embarrassingly, I did exactly the same thing two years later at EuroPython 2019 with Django's logging, uh, with, with Django's logging documentation. I drew up a beautiful plan that led me all the way down into a rabbit hole that only a superhuman effort could have got me out of. Maybe with more time and energy that I didn't have, I could have succeeded in both attempts. But instead, while I was toiling away, other people were landing commits too, and I was never going to be able to catch up enough to get the work into the shape required so that it could be merged. So back to PyTest, I realized more recently that if I were going to succeed in this uh, idea of restructuring its documentation, I'd need to find a completely different approach from the one that I tried before and that had failed. I knew that I would have to do it iteratively, one step at a time. So on the PyTest email list, I proposed having another attempt at it. I had explained that I would need to do it in small pull, in small commits and pull request cycles. And I warned that some of the commits would seem trivial or even banal, and that in order for this attempt to succeed, the pull request would need to be reviewed, approved, and merged much more quickly than normal. And I made it clear that they would have to take on trust that all these little commits would be small steps in a coherent direction of improvement and that the cellular level um, development in each commit would bit by bit bring about a structural evolution of the whole. And they were happy to go along with that. The process has worked very well. The effect of doing it this way has been to make the substantial restructuring parts of the work seem much smaller and easier. Most of the iteration has been in place. Moving things tends to happen naturally when something's shape has been changed and then it seems to demand that itself be moved. Because parts of the documentation evolve gradually to their correct form, anything in their midst, midst that's been left behind stands out. One change or move seems to lead naturally to another. And unlike my previous experience, this has been both successful and enjoyable. It has felt like one without any anxiety of an uncompleted plan hanging over me. Every step along the way has been a step in the right direction, however small. Every step has represented an improvement. The work is not finished, but it's not a work in progress. At every stage, it's at least as complete as it was previously. At every stage, the documentation is more useful than it was before. It's like the metamorphosis of a tadpole into a frog. It's a continuous process. There's no point along the transformation at which we're tempted to say, it's a work in progress, it's complete. It's in a state of uneasy, freakish transition between one thing and another. It just is what it is at each moment. The tadpole's development is unfinished, but that doesn't make it an incomplete frog. It's just a young frog. It's moving in a direction towards maturity. It's enjoying organic development. At each stage, we can pronounce ourselves satisfied with what it is, precisely because we don't insist on delivery of something like the final result, and instead trust the process to take us in that direction because we can see what the process is and what it will do, and we can accept what it gives us along the way. And that's what it felt like to work on the PyTest documentation this time. It's always good to have scientific looking graphs. So here's one showing the usefulness of work driven by planning and of the work that follows a principle of well-formed organic growth. When the workflow is one of concrete, iterative, organic evolution, in the case of both new documentation and restructuring, 
we get more usefulness from our work, more quickly, more consistently, and just more overall. And with less anxiety, because, because there's no grand plan at risk of being upset, there's just a continuous series of responsive little improvements. So, my advice, be concerned with the completeness of your work, not whether it's finished. Follow a principle of well-formed organic growth. Work in concrete, iterative, evolutionary steps. Don't try to solve big problems. Just pick up the nearest small thing that comes to hand, do one small thing to improve it, and then do the cycle again. Instead of making complicated plans, nurture frogs and French beans. It will give you a lot of pleasure to watch them grow. And it's another way to discover how nature can reduce stress. So thank you, DG McKean, for the pictures. And thank you for listening. I'll be happy to answer any questions now or later. I think I'm in the right place here, aren't I? Yes, we are both in the right place somehow. We're both in the right place. <laughs> <laughs> we just thank you for being here. To come along over. No, I'll thank you for uh -huh. my voice. You know. Oh a, boy. Yes, uh, people continue to trickle in, and I will say we are quite tight on time. So um, okay. I yeah. yeah some things. Um, we've got quite a few questions. Um, and I think I'll, I'll turn to a question that Eric posed. Um, he had asked if you had any tips for getting out of a planning process if your organization requires tell it is agile. <laughs> um, how to, if your organization requires a planning process? Well, I, okay, I don't have that problem because I'm in charge of documentation in my organization. So uh, it's normally me telling other people to put away those huge plans they've drawn up because they don't need them. So I don't really know the answer, sorry. Um, I, I guess if you've got working with people who insist on seeing plans, you better make up some fake plans and then just work in like a normal human being. Does that help? I mean, I think a fake plan sounds like a plan to me. <laughs> a fake plan is a plan. Um, Looking at the spreadsheet with the questions, we've got some quite technical questions, but um, hmm, Danielle, did you happen to catch any of the chatter about um, Pomodoro technique? Yes, I, 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 I mean, it was whizzing by quite fast, but uh, yes, yes, I did see that, yes. Um, I can't remember what, what exactly was, somebody did say something related to that about being a little bit kind to yourself. and. You know, this just relieves me from anguish of this idea of unfinished work hanging over my head, of having something that I haven't done kind of stamped out on, 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 on my life so that it's always on my mind. I, I, I just literally stop caring about that. So it's, I mean, if not caring yeah. is a good way to be kind, one way to do it. I think that's wonderful. Um, I have to wait a bit later to share them. Um, I'm going to go ahead to a question from Mike, which is right here in this session chat. Um, are you familiar with the Good Docs project and the templates that are used there? And how, if you are, trust your work. Oh, how might you compare or contrast your work with the Good Docs project templates? Yeah. Um, and uh, it looks really interesting um, doing. Um, interesting, they, the, um, they said you should spend or so much time writing and so much time doing something else. And um i don't want to say that uh much about somebody else's work that I, I i don't really understand i'm sure that there's a great deal of research and understanding in uh what's been said there um all i can say that you know not me maybe that's the the, the fairest thing uh to say I, I do like the idea of templates that um uh, because that's also another way of relieving yourself from anxiety about what you need to do. Um, I don't think there's a uh, problematic uh, about p 
picking some, you know, I think it's really important to be pragmatic in, in this work in about documentation. Just do whatever works for you in the situation that you're in now. Um, I'm a little bit suspicious, you know, the diataxis plan uh, um, scheme gets mistaken for a plan. That's what you have to do. And it's so easy to turn things into plans. Yeah, I will say for now, looking at my notes, um, to any other questions, number one, I'm so glad to know how to refer to this. I, I, you know, framework is already also a loaded term, but for now, I will just call it a framework. I'm so glad to know how to refer to it because I have seen it. Uh, I at the Write the Docs conference in Prague in 2017, and I've I've heard Python developers uh, reference it from the Py PyCon community. Um, so I'm glad to know how to refer to it. <laughs> And um, I'm sorry, I'm going to now skip ahead to uh, a question from Juan. Um, Juan says that you mentioned the need to get buy-in from the PyTest developers, since we're talking about Python. Um, you need to get their buy-in to trust in the long-term effects of the process. Isn't that planning, smiley face? <laughs> but more seriously, um, I'm sorry, how, how to do it when there isn't such upfront um, I think the f talking to people helps um, gaining consensus. You know, if you if I'm going to spend an hour doing something to prepare for some work, gaining consensus, building up trust with people, um, then I, then by drawing up a plan, whether it's a plan for other people to do the work that I want them to do, or whether it's something that I'm proposing to do. Um, similarly, with with consensus, you know, w when you're gaining consensus, you, you've got the opportunity to talk to people above and and below, and it gives you a huge amount of confidence, knowing that you're doing work, and they, the other people, are also going to be happy with that things are unfolding like this. So, it's work that needs preparation rather than. But yeah, that's a good question. Okay, one says thanks for your answer. Um, a question earlier from Swapnil. Uh, <laughs> I'll just read this as is. How does the process scale as the proverbial garden grows? That, that's a, a really good uh, question. I don't have direct experience of that happening with something really large. Um, the experience with Py because PyTest is a very busy project and lots of things happen at once there. And in this case, the tiny size of commits really helps make sure, you know, there was, n I don't think I ever ran into a merge conflict issue because also agreed to merge things really quickly. So as soon as I wrote something, within a few hours, it was normally merged. It was, and things are very easy to slot into each other when they're happening in, in small pieces. And so I, I'm confident that this could be scaled uh, very large with the right kind of um, with the right kind of project. But it needs that buy-in. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so. Running out of time, um, I'm going to share some of my own thoughts and notes, um, and then I am going to ask and ask people to get in touch if they have any um, anything else you'd like to share, and and then I'm going to share some announcements before we go to the next presentation. So here are my own thoughts that I feel so grateful to share. Um, thank you, Daniele, for 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 being here today. Um, I really loved uh, your poetic comparisons to the French beans and the the frogs. Um, your references to the pain of suffering that we experience in our positions. And here, I would like to ask you again, um, how might people contact you? And is there anything else you'd like to share here? Yeah, um, well, th thanks everyone for all your, your comments, much appreciated and for listening. Um, my email address is on the talk, I'll, I'll put my details in this chat right here so people can, can, can see what they are. I'll be happy to answer further questions um, 
here or at some other time. Um, if people want to see the framework, I'll, I'll put the link uh, in here as well. And um, the only other thing I would say is that if somebody's uh, representing a company that's got a huge documentation problem at the structural level that uh, they want some help with, um, give me a call because I'll be free from the end of June after my break. So thank you so much for uh, hosting this and uh, thanks for listening. <laughs>